Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video and the next, we're going to be talking about cranial nerve 3, which is the oculomotor nerve. This is a purely motor nerve with no sensory function whatsoever, and the motor in its name should give that away. Purely motor. However, the motor function can be divided into somatic motor function and parasympathetic motor function. And for that reason, we're going to divide these two functions into two separate videos. So here we'll be talking about the somatic motor function of the oculomotor nerve. Now a couple of things here. Look at this cross section of the brainstem. You can see the substantia nigra here. Here's the red nucleus. This over here is actually the paraaqueductal gray matter. So this is actually a cross section of the midbrain. In the previous videos when we talked about cranial nerves 1 and 2, olfactory and optic, those are the only two cranial nerves that do not in any way involve the brain stem. But when we start talking about cranial nerves 3 through 12, these involve the brain stem to some extent. And cranial nerves 3 and 4 originate in the midbrain, 4 being the trochlear nerve, which will be two videos from now. So cranial nerve 3 is associated with two components, two separate nuclei. This one here in blue is called the Edinger-Westphal nucleus. This is the part that's going to be parasympathetic and the next video. Then over here in red we have the GSE component of cranial nerve 3. That stands for general somatic effect. So somatic being this is going to be voluntary contraction of muscles associated with the eye, and those are the extrinsic eye muscles. These are voluntary muscles that move the eyeball within the orbit. Now, out of these six extrinsic eye muscles, four of them, these ones in the middle, are innervated by the oculomotor nerve. The first one is the medial rectus muscle, which is right here. This one moves the eye immediately towards the nose. Then there's the superior rectus muscle on top here. This one elevates the eye and turns it slightly medially. Then we have the inferior rectus down here. This depresses the eye and also turns it slightly medially. And then we have the inferior oblique muscle. That's this one right here, inferior oblique. This one elevates the eye and actually turns it a little bit laterally. You'll notice that the other two muscles, lateral rectus, is innervated by the abducens nerve because by moving the eye laterally, that actually angles it away from the midline, thus abduction, thus the name abducens nerve. And then the superior oblique muscle is innervated by the trochlear nerve. We will briefly talk about that in two videos from now, cranial nerve four. But these are the four extrinsic eye muscles innervated by the oculomotor nerve. So now let's talk about the pathway of the oculomotor nerve. I've got two pictures here. This one on the left shows virtually the same things as it does over here, but it might be a little clearer on this side. Now remember, down here at the bottom is the midbrain. In fact, over here you can see paraaqueductal gray matter, red nucleus, so this is the midbrain. And the origin of the oculomotor nerve is the midbrain. We have two regions over here. We have the EW, that's the Edinger-Westphal nucleus. That's for the parasympathetic part that I have in green. In gold here, and originating from this blue nucleus, is the GSE, general somatic effect, controlling the extrinsic eye muscles. So we're going to follow the axons of this oculomotor nerve right here, and we're initially going to exit the midbrain and cross two arteries. In fact, we're going to go over the superior cerebellar artery and then underneath the posterior cerebral artery. If you look really closely at this picture and over here, you'll see that. And we're going to keep traveling anteriorly, and actually the oculomotor nerve is going to enter through something called the cavernous sinus. This is actually a space within the sphenoid bone. It's going to cross through that here. Now after exiting the cavernous sinus here, the GSE component of the oculomotor nerve, which remember is in gold, is going to bifurcate into two separate divisions. On the left is the upper division, and on the right is the lower division. And I tried to show the upper division with a higher arrow and the lower division with a lower arrow. Okay? Now both of these divisions, upper and lower, are then going to exit the cranium by moving through the superior orbital fissure. And this is going to allow them to enter the orbit where the eyeball is, and therefore the extrinsic eye muscles. Now the upper division is going to go into the orbit and ultimately control two muscles. The first one is an extrinsic eye muscle. This is the superior rectus muscle. Remember that elevates the eye and turns it a little bit medially. 
And then this other one is not an extrinsic eye muscle because it does not move the eyeball, but it is in that area. It's called levator palpebrae superioris. Uh, this one is involved in elevating the eyelid. So opening the eyelid is controlled by this muscle. Uh, it doesn't seem like a very important muscle to talk about, but when you start doing a cranial nerve examination, if you see a drooping eyelid, that is an indicator that you might actually have some dysfunction with cranial nerve 3. It could be an intrinsic problem with this nerve. It could also be a problem with the midbrain. For example, an arterial insufficiency of the midbrain. So this is an important muscle to actually know, believe it or not. And then the lower division here goes to the other three extrinsic eye muscles that are controlled via cranial nerve three. Inferior oblique, which remember elevates the eye and then also turns it a little bit laterally. Medial rectus turns it medially and inferior rectus depresses the eyeball and moves it just a little bit medially. So that's where we're going to conclude this video. That's the general somatic effect of the oculomotor nerve. In the next video, we'll pick up with the parasympathetic part of it, beginning with the Edinger-Westfall nucleus. And luckily, the pathway is very, very similar. It's just going to diverge a little bit once we get through that superior orbital fissure. So make sure to join us then. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.